<laughs> okay, Mr. Robert, uh, tell us please how did you became uh, for your style? Okay, all right. Well, it's funny because I suppose every artist wants a style. So when I was younger, I was kind of, in a way, I was transfixed about uh, finding a style. I must have a style. I must have a style. I must. Mm -hmm. And and in a way, if you look for a style, it doesn't come, or if you, or the style that you get becomes too um, false. You know, it's not a real kind of motivation for your work. Thinking I've got to have a style. I've got to have a style. So I remember back there was a uh, there was a film called um, Under the Tuscan Sun, and there's a bit about a lady when she said she was a little girl, she had a jam jar and she wanted to collect ladybugs. Mm -hmm. And when she was looking for the ladybug, she couldn't find any. But then she was tired and she fell asleep. And when she woke up, she was covered in ladybugs. And the ladybugs had found her. And that's a, the reason I say that is because that's a little bit like it happened with my style. Over a period of time, and I mean painting hundreds, hundreds of uh, paintings. I mean, I remember in the early days, I used to count every painting I did. I used to go, oh, that's one two paintings three paintings mm -hmm. but eventually you, you that doesn't matter either because you just paint you know you just paint yeah and as you paint a style develops through different influences i suppose my my as i say one of my biggest influences was hawkers by david hockney because i remember when i was over in his studio he showed me about mixing paint and getting bright colors not by adding white mm -hmm. which tends to make paint go opaque and sort of milky and muddy. But if you thin the paint down, the paint becomes more translucent and brighter. Mm -hmm. So I thought about that and thought, well, that you know, kind of makes sense. And another thing is a lot of artists in the traditional style will paint sepia or dark brown across the whole canvas first, and then they'll start putting color on top of that after yeah. they've put the uh, um, initial shadows in a sepia or a dark reddy mm -hmm. brown. Mm -hmm. That's traditional oil painting, which I was doing at the time. And I didn't, that whole idea of um, starting with one color or across the whole canvas, I, I never really got on with that. So you can see, for instance, with the, um, with the painting uh, behind me here, uh, in the orange section and in the background here, there are lots of different colors mm -hmm. which I flood I flood the canvas with first it's a first uh, so layer. The, the first layer is just a is a I spray the whole canvas with mm -hmm. water rather like a watercolor mm -hmm. and then after that I uh, start putting color on and it bleeds into each other mm -hmm. and then I let that dry which of course here in this kind of climate can be about 15 minutes then I do repeat the process and then I might lift the canvas up so I get runs going down mm -hmm. if I'm painting a jungle or if I'm painting uh, leaves and trees everything that grows grows upwards that nature grows towards the light mm, yeah so you don't get things growing across or down you get them going up looking for the light to feed on so if you dribble if you put uh, paint on a canvas then you lift it up and they dribbles down if you then turn that over it's dribbling up yeah. so you get these lines which look like growth lines. Uh -huh. And even if, <clears throat> as you do the painting, even if they nearly disappear, the human eye is an amazing thing. It will pick up any tiny little in, in discrepancy. And so it sees these lines without you really realizing it. So it gives everything a, a, a lift, you know, a real kind of lightness mm -hmm. to the surface. So that was something that I discovered as I went along and I thought, wow, that's really, you know, I love that. And then these big patches of color often look like something. You know, sometimes when you look up in the air and you see clouds and you think, oh, that looks like a dog or that looks like an elephant. Yeah, yeah. You In painting, you can see the same thing. And I'll often see leaves and trees and people which are just smudges of color. And if I see that, I go with it and I start to create the image so I draw I draw a person where yeah. there's there's a person already in a way uh -huh. and that brings me to a really important point with Bali and the Balinese because the Balinese are very everybody knows Hindu spirituality the Balinese are very very 
um, keyed, tuned into their environment with the offerings that they do every day, with the prayers, with the temples, with the tree, the banyan trees. Yeah. So the the Balinese become inseparable, really, to the to the um, environment, and that really excited me as well because it all it goes with this idea of pattern within the surface and these blended colours. If I pick out a figure like the rice workers here, you know, they're like ghosts in a way, really. But the rice workers cannot be separated from the rice field. Mm -hmm. They're together, they're like Siamese twins. And, you know, you'd have to surgically remove them to get them out because they're part of Bali and Bali yeah. is part of them. So I love that. I love that idea of figures and leaves and trees being part of each other. And, the, you know, I've done a lot of, like, pr prayers and ceremonies and things like that. And I love that idea that you cannot separate. Mm -hmm. And so there, then I then start painting colour which merges together. So the, so the rice worker in the heat, this is the heat of the day, remember, you know, they're working at 12 noon, one o'clock, so it's hot and the sun is bearing down on them. So the oranges and the pinks and the, and the hot pur uh, purples, um, they become, they show the fact that the rice workers are working in heat. And then the purples and the reds and the magentas in the rice itself are the same colours as the legs and the arms and the heads. Mm -hmm. So the people are connected to yeah, the connected. to the landscape. So that to was nature. what it was about. Nature, nature and people are one. Mm -hmm. And even dogs on the beach or you know, they're all inseparable. And I love that idea. Mm -hmm. So my work is very much around that that kind of thing. Mark making building up layers of colour, six, seven, eight, nine, ten layers of colour before mm -hmm. I even start the painting. Mm -hmm. And then pulling out, you know, colours, accentuating colours, complementary colours. Yeah. As soon as you put a green and a red together, mm -hmm. the red makes the green look greener and the green makes the red look redder. So you get this popping effect. Yeah. So I use that in a lot. It's not, you know, accidental that I use orange and blue together because you put them side by side and they both go wow <laughs> so that you know that's what I, I wanted to do so my my colors became complementary my shadows you know we I, I went to an exhibition of Monet in New York with David Hockney and we walked around and we came out and there was a fire hydrant with a shadow on a street in New York and but we both looked at this and at the same time we both went purple for the shadow, because we'd been so tuned in to looking at the way that Monet saw shadows and colour, yeah. that when we saw it, we, we our, our eyes were already tuned to, to not seeing grey. Yeah. Most people see black yes, or yes. grey, you know, shadow, black. Yeah. It's not, it's no. purple or it's pink, you know, or it's, it's a, a rich ochre, um, yellow or it's a brown. You know, it's any colour you want it to be. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you break away from the convention of perspective, the convention of what what colours things really are. You see the pictures of my old ladies. You know their faces are blue and yes, orange and red. Yes, yes. Who, who cares? It doesn't matter. Nice no, many colours. You can do any colour you want. So this spectrum of colour opens up. So it's yeah. like somebody's opened this kind of secret garden to you. Uh -huh. And once you walk through that door, and you and you go, my God, you know anything's possible. So you don't get, as a Bradford lad who, you know, grew up in a, through mills and smoke and grime and rain and, you know, ugh, being able to ha get these kind of colors now is just tremendous fun. It's like painting in a sweet shop, you know. It's, there's no, there's no, there's no surprise. There's no mystery in why Kit Kats have red wrappers, mm, yeah. you know, or Cadbury's Flakes have blue and yellow wrappers. The, the advertising guys, they know that you put bright colours on mm -hmm. packets and people go, whoa, they, they go to, they want to buy it, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So they, the, so it's there, it's a thing that, you know, people love. And I love, I don't mind about people, I mean, if people love my work, great. Mm -hmm. If they don't love my work, I love my work. So mm -hmm. a painter should be painting for himself. He shouldn't be painting for other people. Mm -hmm. If other people like it, it's a bonus. And I hope they do, but you don't paint thinking, oh, this one will sell. 
or you know I'll, I'll paint this because so and so likes elephants so I'll paint an elephant you don't do that you paint because you want to get good results mm -hmm. <coughs> for yourself you know yes, yes. Uh, you can see the shape of the Buddha but he's part of the landscape mm -hmm. and the rice fields go over over him uh -huh. so he becomes part of the the whole thing and I, you know I think that's uh, yeah that's the way I'm kind of heading like this market one you see this market one's very early yeah, yeah. it's mm -hmm. a market piece but <clears throat> you see the, the the shape of the boxes and the containers uh -huh. and then the people which will be in amongst they're kind of the part of it you know it, it all, it'll all merge into one I, and you, you couldn't take the person out because it's like a box or a, uh -huh. you know some a big bunch of, of um, celery or something yeah. you know it's part of it and and part of the reason of that is because the color that I've put on already c connects it all together you know it, it it links it all together so it becomes like a, a puzzle that's been already made you know uh -huh. but, so but uh, I, I, I saw that uh, the first layer it's not a response with uh, mm. figure. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's not matter. No. No. Uh -huh. You know, the first layer was really thin. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we get more and more and more. And there's about six or seven layers on here. You know, oh. uh -huh. already. And it's not finished. You know, it's not. I haven't finished that yet. Yeah. So there'll be more layers. Yeah. Because at one time I thought I was going to do a big jungle thing, so I started doing big leaves. Ah. Uh -huh. You see, and then I thought, no, I, I don't know why it made me start to think about a market really, but then. I thought, no, I'm going to change it, and then, but this doesn't matter, you know, mm -hmm. because it'll all become part of it. Picture of boys. It's uh, your early period. It's not uh, the same style. No, it's earlier. It's it's earlier, but you 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 learn everything you do. Uh -huh. You learn from it. Yeah. And then you take a little bit. It might just be a little. It's like when you make. If you're cooking something, mm -hmm. you know, you might take a little bit of garlic from one recipe and you might put that garlic in to another recipe and yeah. you because you learn that you like the taste or you like the smell so you incorporate mm -hmm. that that thing into something else which is new new but you can still see the connection you know yes and and when you get a place like studio number one in uh, Ubud mm -hmm. And you um, you see all the paintings, although a lot of them are very different. Yeah, you can still see the connection of how they've got from A to B, because the journey shows you along the way. It picks up all these different colors, shapes, you know, mark making sizes, composition, whatever. You can see the reason why it's got to where it is. You know, so I couldn't do this. Mm -hmm. without having done the boy one or the dog one or because it all they all have a they all have a piece you know of the jigsaw so it, it's um, it's a it's an ongoing thing constantly and that's what's that's what's great about art because if you were just knocking out the same thing you know there's some people in China yeah. who knock out the Mona Lisa mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. for copying you know to send to Paris yeah Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, Mona, well, you know, like anything, you have to develop, I think, singers, you know, artists, writers, they all develop through different ways, and that's yeah. the way that I've developed, you know, is through yeah. these different styles, but yeah. you can still tell it's me, I think, you know? Yeah, that's a good aim. You have to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. and developing and if you get used to you know I can paint like photorealism I, c I can paint incredibly accurately mm -hmm. making things look exactly like they should be but it's boring really yeah. because you might as well take a f camera you know you might as well take a photo mm -hmm. photorealism people go oh photorealism's fantastic well the skill is great but why would you want to do it uh -huh. I think painting should do something tell you something different about the subject it's yeah. got to be from the heart so you know it has to be intrinsically different to reality otherwise look at reality yeah, yeah. you know what I mean and, I, and it's interesting because going back to that Madonna thing when I was in California the telephone rang it was Madonna 
I had a long conversation with her. David was in the bedroom doing something and he came, oh, oh is it love? And I said, it's, it's Madonna, Madonna's on the phone. He went, oh, tell her to fuck off. And I went, what? And, he, he, and then I put the phone down and uh, he said, uh, she wants me to do a portrait of her, um, but he said, I, I only want to do portraits of people I know because a portrait should be more yeah. than a, a representation of the person. It should say something about something about, something about inside, the person. Inside. And he said, I don't know her, so I can't paint her, you see. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Madonna's Madonna, so probably she'd give him loads of money to do it. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't interested because he's got this integrity mm -hmm. of saying, I can paint people who I've got to know and I can show something about that person in the way that they you know, the, the way that their face is. And, I, and it's the same with everything. That's why with my paintings, I'm trying to show something above and beyond the reality of Bali, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and anyway, in, in any case, what's the reality of Bali? Because everybody's reality of Bali will be different. Yeah, yeah. Some people's reality of Bali is sitting on a beach in Kuta with a Bintang yeah. beer all day, yeah. doing nothing else. Mm -hmm. Other people's reality is, is sitting on the swing and flicking the hair back and doing Instagram pictures. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Everybody's reality of Bali is different. My reality of Bali yeah. is not, I'm not saying it's the reality or it's the way that everybody should look at Bali. No, it's just Robert's view of Bali. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what reality is all about everywhere. You know, how do we know what is real and what isn't real? And how do I know your red is the same as my red? Or your taste of strawberry is the taste of my yes, taste of yes, strawberry. Yes. We still know it's delicious, yeah. but your strawberry might be banana. <laughs> and my strawberry, you know what I mean? So <laughs> yes. how do we know? We don't know. Yeah. And that's great, isn't it? That's what it should, that's about that's great, individuality. Yes. That's what mm -hmm. it's all about. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's kind of how I've lived my uh, life in the last uh, few years, really, is learn. And the older you get, the more you learn and the mm -hmm. more the more confident you become and the more uh, the, the more unconcerned you are with what other people think. That doesn't mean to say that you go around being incredibly annoying and rude and I mean you still have to be uh, a good person but the way that you um, you plan your life and you do your life is you know is, is, is up to you and it gets more important the older you get because you realize the less time you have. You know, time becomes important. Yes. When you're 20, time doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, you know, you're invincible. Mm -hmm. When you wake up and you start having aches and pains and, you know, you fall down the steps like I did the other week and then you you don't get better straight away. You know, it takes weeks and weeks and weeks for your arm to feel better. You realise you're getting old. So you have to make the most of, you know, while, when whilst you're here mm -hmm. as well. So that's another important thing. So... That's, that's the way I live my life, really. I think I literally have paintings all over the world in every continent except the North Pole and the South Pole, the polar continent, you know, the polar ice things, everywhere from Africa to the West to Turkey to everywhere people have the paintings. And it's lovely because, you know, when you see pictures of the studio in Penistana, and my house and the collections and everything. That's only a tiny tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. of the ones that have gone out. Oh. You know, there might be 150 paintings up in, in Penistana, mm -hmm. but you know, I've probably sold 500 paintings. Mm. So, yeah. so the, the um, and you know, it's easy to forget uh, where they go and what, where, you know, what kind of people buy them. But I look at them almost like sort of children really. So I, you know, I remember everything I did and where it went. And <clears throat> with with having Masari in the restaurant and having the exhibition there and people coming in there from all over the world anyway, yeah. visiting Bali, yeah. people, you know, the nations come to you rather than you go into the nations. In the old days, I used to travel a lot, but now I really don't travel very much in real terms, especially this last two and a half years, nobody has. Mm -hmm. But 
um, I can get somebody one day coming in from Canada mm -hmm. and buying a painting and then the next day somebody coming from Saudi Arabia and yeah. buying a painting. That's great. So they go all over, you know, they're dispersed all over the place yeah. like chaff in the wind, you know, <laughs> gone. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. really lovely. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, and I'm, you know, I've got stuff in museums and art galleries <clears throat> around the world. I don't when I when I when I read artists and they've always got a, a sort of chronological thing of you know this exhibition that exhibition in this collection in that collection. It, it okay, it's great, but it doesn't really mean a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I like the memories of where they've gone. You know, rather than I don't have to log everything. Um, I think that's quite a Western thing as well, in a way. It's it's good enough to know that it's, there's nothing better than when somebody like you did, when somebody comes to you and says, oh, "I really like your work," you know, yeah. especially I yeah. like this one, yeah. or I like that one, or like the purple one you've got with the birds. Yes. Yes. You know, I love that one. That's really nice for me mm -hmm. to get that input, and it and it sort of inspires you to do more. You know, that makes you think, "Wow." Oh, people like my work. You know, <laughs> you kind of, you know, everybody likes a pat on the back. Mm -hmm. If when people go, oh no, I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. No, nah, they're, they're not. They're lying, really, because you can see. You know, if you see if you see somebody on the street and you say, "Good morning," you're looking good today. You can see them kind of go, "Hmm, <laughs> I'm yes. looking good today." You know what I mean? Yes, it's not yes, everybody yes. likes it. Yeah. So it's lovely when people. For an artist, there's nothing better than when somebody comes and says to you, mm -hmm. I really like your work. I mean, that's wonderful, really. And a lot of people come and say, I really like your work, but I can't afford it. Well, it's still really nice, you know. And sometimes I've said, well, <laughs> take that one, you know, because it's really <laughs> nice. Because I know that they, even though they can't afford it and I'm not getting any money for it, I, I know it, they're going to give it a really good home mm -hmm. and they're going to love it. So mm -hmm. what's better than that, you know? So it's uh, that sort of thing, collecting, yes, great. You know, the price is going up, yes, they do. Um, people like to collect. You know, collectors are funny things because sometimes people collect all one thing, theme, mm -hmm. jungles, yeah. you know, <clears throat> ceremonies, boys, whatever. But then other people like to collect stages of work. That's an early piece. That's a middle piece. This mm -hmm. is the new stuff. Mm -hmm. They like to get a spread of the work. Yeah. And a lot of people are like that. They want an early one, and there aren't many of those left. Mm -hmm. And then they want, you know, a middle, middle ground, and then they want a later one to show the development of yeah. the work, which mm -hmm. is lovely because it shows that they really, really take an interest in what yes. you're doing. Yes. Other people like the subject matter. They might collect, you know, they might collect pictures of dogs. Uh, from lots of different artists, so they uh, want a dog from me yeah. because they've got other dogs, you know. But it's so you never really know why until they sit down and talk to you and explain it, and then that's really you know lovely. I had a lady who bought a, I did some big iris, big purple, no, sorry, big uh, yellow and orange irises. There's some in the back garden, and I painted them on big long canvases, and they were on exhibition in England. And uh, a lady came in and said, I want to buy that. <coughs> it was lovely. Yes, okay. She said, because my mum, when we were little, we grew up in Singapore. Uh -huh. And when we were in Singapore, those irises were in our garden. Uh -huh. And it makes me remember my childhood. Wow. Hey, isn't that lovely? And yeah, I said, oh, that's yeah, so lovely. You know, so, the, so people, people buy things and collect things for different reasons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if they tell you and they share the story with you, it's lovely. Um, so there's a lot, you know, a lot of that goes on and a lot of people, I do get a lot of people who say, you know, I really, really love your work, but I can't afford it. And what I, I should start really is to do some limited edition prints and mm. things and maybe t-shirts, <laughs> uh -huh. earrings, yeah, yeah, yeah. so people can have a rubber, you know, but like a scarf or a, it might be quite nice. I did, at one time I did limited edition prints. I even did um, table uh, mats, mm -hmm. sets, and every table mat was a different painting, and they went really well. 
the, you know, the people had them on the tables and mugs with painting on and stuff. And then you know, many people uh, now uh, many people. collect uh, NFTs. Y yeah, no? yes, NFTs. exactly. NFT, yeah. you see, NFTs now, yeah. because some people on N NFT, they want, you know, they've got the crypto, they think, well, instead of keeping the crypto, I'm going to invest in, it's a bit like stocks and shares. Yeah. People will say, let's buy a Robert Walker and let's put it aside and within two years, let's see the price go up. Mm -hmm. You know, the prices on an NFT have increased from the studio, the you know the the the, the painting the the uh, the prices go up as people are interested in him and and buy them. So, yeah. you know, with NFT for me, it's a new um, it's a a, a new uh, road, a new avenue yeah. to a, experiment with, and I've learnt it through you mm -hmm. uh, and tr to try it. Uh, and also the other thing is is that NFT is international worldwide yes. so they don't have to come to Bali to buy a painting they stumble across it on NFT that they weren't aware of mm -hmm. and then they've got the facility to say I'll transfer that into the, the other mm -hmm. NFT account and they can get something which is maybe 10,000 miles away from where they are but they can enjoy it and see it first. Mm -hmm. So, you know, technology brings people closer together yes. in that yes. respect. And if they can begin to collect uh, through something like NFT, it's, um, you know, it can only be good, really. In, in you know, in, the, only, the only slight problem is that you, you, you can't speak to them face to face, mm -hmm. but then they can send you messages and you can share stories. Mm -hmm and they can watch things like this. So they can get a bit of an inroad into how I, my brain works. And then having a piece of Robert's work on their wall, they, that's a way to connect. So, you know, it's great. All power to the paintbrush. Really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, tell me please about what Traditional artwork. Balinese Chinese. work. Yeah. I, I like it. I, I get... Um, Again, you can, a lot of Balinese work is subdued in color mm -hmm. um, until somebody like Ari Smith came along uh, mm -hmm. in Tabali, Donald Friend, and then the, uh, the colors became brighter because they, you see again, Balinese artists are Balinese artists who learn and so they take what they, you know, from Western artists that came to Bali, they begin to see possibilities of changing their work and making it brighter like uh, Antonio Blanco like Blanco uh -huh. and maybe you know maybe the uh, the subject matter is very traditional but the way in which it's painted becomes mm -hmm. more western or western influenced mm -hmm. then of course the western artists do the opposite they come and they see the Balinese work mm -hmm. with the the tiered rice fields and the the mango pickers and the you know the the rice ladies threshers and they interpret that in yeah. their western style which is what i'm doing really so both feed off each other uh -huh. so it's not like the western artists are better than the balinese or the balinese are better than the west you should be learning from each other all the time yeah so crossovers are great mm -hmm. penistanan is is known as the new artist village because a lot of the western artists went there and you know Simon who was a very good friend of mine mm -hmm. uh, from America was in Bali 40 years and did these incredible paintings I've got a lot of his paintings around but the Balinese learned from Simon and Simon learned from the Balinese mm -hmm. and I'm doing the same thing I'm learning I'm my friend Madi Rajid mm -hmm. who is a fantastic artist in Penistana doing these big pink flowers which are just so beautiful that I could never do I couldn't do those mm -hmm. <clears throat> He couldn't do my stuff, but I can't do his. But we can learn and talk, and yeah. learn from each, you know, learn from each other. And we're both, we're both fans of each other. I love his work. He loves my work. So we share that. We share a love of art, and a love of art is a love of art. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's done in painting or in in uh, virtual art, digital art, or whether it's uh, music or dance. It's art, yeah. you know. And it and it's this, you know, the only. The only thing that walks on the earth that does art are human beings. There's no other animal or creature or hoppy, flyy thing anywhere that does art. Human beings have this this need mm -hmm. to do to to create. Yes. And people would say, oh well, you know, some birds create nests or a, a spider creates a web. 
A spider creates a web only to catch flies in mm -hmm. to eat. It's not going back and thinking, oh, I'll put another bit there, I'll do another bit there. It's not, it's a survival thing. You know, when, when peacocks show their feathers and strut around the place, it's only because they're trying to chat up another peacock. Mm -hmm. They're not doing it strictly for the reason of creating art. And a human being has this need, this passion, to create something beautiful in its eyes, in the spirit, you know, whether, whether you call it spiritual or create, there's, there's a need to do it. And since cavemen, you know, daubed bits of ochre on their fingers and painted bison, or, you know, hunt, hunting parties on, on stone walls, mm -hmm. mankind has created art for no reason other than the beauty of that art that they are creating. Yeah. And that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful family tree to be in mm -hmm. you know i'm part of that i'm part of that that history of human beings no matter religion race yeah, yeah. sex yeah. wherever they are from mm -hmm. it's about creating something beautiful in mm -hmm. their eyes and that's wonderful that's better than blowing things up and shooting people you know it's a positive thing where you're adding to the to the joy of life you know and that's what everything is about ultimately it's the joy of life and the love of life. David Hockney says, love life. Yeah. It's the love of life. And it's, it should be joyous. And to celebrate it by creating a wonderful piece of, you know, Mozart creating a wonderful concerto or whatever way you do it, love life. That's a good place to end. That's a great point. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, Mr. Robert, tell us about your animals, your lovely <laughs> in animals. Okay, um, well, <clears throat> a while ago I started going to the uh, Fasaburung, which is the bird market in Denpasar, and uh, was kind of really sad about seeing all the birds in cages. And, uh, you know, you want to do something about it, but you can't do something about all of them. So I chose owls because I've always sort of had a thing about uh, Owls being so beautiful, one used to live in my house in uh, England, so I always had a soft spot for them. So I started buying the owls, baby pygmy owls, from the bird market and then bringing them back to my house and rearing them and feeding them and teaching them how to hunt crickets and then eventually letting them go. So, so far I've released 70 owls into the local uh, environment and at the moment I've got two uh, two owls, one in a tree that I think you've already seen the picture and then one that comes back to visit me every night for food but flies around wherever he wants and then the other week this little dog was in my garage uh, I called him Hobo and he was so, his skin was so bad and bleeding and he was not very happy at all so I took him to the vet and now he's, uh, he's eating my shirt and now he's uh, much better his hair's growing and he's now my new little dog so what can you do when you see something like that that needs a bit of love so he's now my dog Andy the other dog was a, a rescue dog he was found in the rice fields all thin you couldn't believe it now but mm -hmm. he used to be thin and scrawny and uh, very sad figure but now he's healthy and fit and has been with me for six years and then I have a bale over in a big cage there that was in a tiny little cage that I rescued him at least put him in a better cage I can't let him go because he's not he's not native to Bali but at least I can give him a better life he won't come out of the cage I've tried but he's frightened and then I've got a parrot who was in a tiny cage and he's called Laurie and he comes out every day for his muesli at breakfast time and yogurt and then he flies around and then he goes back to his cage a bit later on in the day. And then there's a new little baby bird that I bought from the uh, bird market about a week ago. And he's learning how to eat. And, he, and his friends, he's the same birds are in the trees around, so eventually he'll, he'll fly away. So they're all kind of, you know, they're all free entities and can go if they want or stay if they want. And uh, if they go, then there are two cats around as well that were rescued, uh, bought from the bird market, and they're sleeping somewhere at the moment. But it's about trying to do 
you kind of try and pay it forward, you know, it's trying to make, do your own little bit. I always think if everybody does their own little bit of kindness and love in the world and casts a stone and makes the ripples, if everybody did that, all the ripples would join up and it would be a nicer, a nicer world really. I know that sounds a bit kind of ooh, sentimental and everything, but it's true, you know, really. Mm. Pay it forward, be nice, be kind, mm -hmm. be kind to people. Yeah. You know, be kind to animals, don't step on anything if you can help it. Just just be kind is the watchword really. In general, be kind. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Thank you okay. very much.